All right, we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining Mark McCumber and I. Um, we're here at beautiful TPC Sawgrass, um, and we have the pleasure of broadcasting from the Champions Locker Room tonight. Um, so I wanted to not only thank Mark for being here, but uh, also the general manager, Bill Hughes, for, for giving us the opportunity. And, um, and without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll get going here. Um, thanks for coming on, Mark. Happy to be here, man. Um, absolutely awesome, awesome experience getting to know you and, and growing up through junior golf ranks. Um, I learned invaluable information <laughs> from you uh, from the age of 13 until I transitioned into, uh, into college, James Madison, actually. Um, uh, I guess I wanted to start tonight um, with a little something for you guys out there, uh, the junior golfers in the crowd. Um, first and foremost, if, you know, at very least, I want you guys to come away with, um, with learning something, whether it's junior golf, college golf, that's all great and awesome. Um, but tonight we have a, a special opportunity to talk to, um, one of the real good guys of the game, um, 10 time PGA tour winner, uh, one of those wins, which came in. Um, awesome fashion here at the players right here uh, right here and uh, that's why we have access to this locker room actually um, so I'm gonna keep it interactive um, if there's a break and you guys want to shout out a question feel free to do so uh, otherwise keep your computer muted and um, and and like I said if anything um, you know make tonight and, and come in tonight with with the purpose to learn at least one thing um, from Mark that'll that'll better you and yourself and um, your game and your opportunity to play uh, college golf down the road. All right, Mark, um, we'll get started. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about junior golf. Um, you know, Tyler and I got the opportunity to meet at a very young age and, and play and come up through the ranks, um, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, how, how much has the game changed since even you were a junior in Jacksonville? I mean, you grew up here, you played all the courses around here, now you design them um, and do a wonderful job of it, at that. Um, how much has the game changed and, and what have you seen from your perspective? I think all of us who follow golf have seen a lot of changes in the game itself. Um, I think we've talked so much about the equipment change. Uh, I think the difference in equipment for those who are serious golfers, they realize uh, golf is more of a power game now. When I grew up and watching yeah. the pros that I watched, like the Nicholas Sissou was a powerful player. He was a power golfer, but also worked the ball. But I played and competed against the Trevinos, the Watsons, and, and, and the, all those Hall of Famers, the Raymond Floyds, and the game really was more of a personalized style. Uh, very few players swung alike, and those three I mentioned all swung totally different. It seems like there's so much education now, so much information out there for juniors who want to take it in, that a lot of them try to emulate, which is normal, mm -hmm. they try to emulate the swings of great players. When you look at Adam Scott when he came on the scene, it was like a version of Tiger Woods, and he said that he yeah, patterned his game after Tiger. And that's nothing new. We've always patterned our games. I tried to copy some of the things that Arnold Palmer did because – he was the big golf hero when I was a kid, and Jack Nicklaus. Um, but I think the, the very fact that the game has become so much, um, it, it's grown so much, uh, and there's so much information and knowledge, and I think that's a double-edged sword, Mike, because I think sometimes junior golfers and parents might forget that it's still a game. So I think when I was a kid, we truly played it because we loved the game. We weren't thinking about college scholarships. We weren't thinking about, we may have been dreaming of playing in a U.S. Open or a Masters, which I think every kid does. Or a Ryder Cup. Or a Ryder Cup, which is quite exciting. But I think the game has become, there's more information out there, and you've got to be careful what information you take in and, and, and who you listen to, because everybody's got an opinion. 
They're like noses. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the information you get may be not that good. So you really have to have a good filter and someone you can count on to help filter things and where you should go in your game with how to act, how to develop a better golf game and all the things you need to do. You need someone that you can really trust and rely on. Interesting. I mean, with the additions these days with TrackMan and all these video-based systems that we have, um, and the instructors catching on to that, um, that's that's pretty much what everyone has access to. Yeah, but but the challenge for that to me is I never wanted to see my swing. I, yeah, you know, and there we had we had cameras. And why is that? Well, because it didn't look like I it felt to me mm -hmm. when I first saw it. I went, wow, that's not how it appears to me. It it, it threw me off. I played very much by feel. I was a, I reacted to ball flight. And I, I really think great players, a lot of great players, I'm not putting myself in that category, but I think players who've had some success know how to see, see what happens and then react by feel and what changes to make. If you've got to go take a picture of your swing and see what position you were in to know why you had a bad shot, I think that makes the game way too hard. Yeah. So it, I, I don't think I don't think video's bad. I don't think TrackMan's bad. TrackMan is incredibly good mm -hmm. for getting fitted with the right equipment. Mm -hmm. Because if we wanted a ball low or curve it, we had just to figure out how to do it. But with TrackMan now, you get the right spin ratios, launch angles. You'll find out whether a certain shaft has got too much flex, not enough flex, all those different things. So I think in that respect, technology is good. But I think using technology to try to develop a mechanically pretty swing, I think is a big mistake. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, one other thing that we already touched on that really struck me, you studied Arnold Palmer. How, how influential was that for you? And um, you know, how much did that differentiate your practice, um, your knowledge of the game? I'm sure it certainly heightened that. And how would you, uh, you know, relate to a junior golfer today? And, and well, what would you tell? Them? Let me tell you. When I was 11 years old, I grew up in Jacksonville, like Mike said, and I grew up on a public golf course, Hyde Park, designed by Donald Ross mm -hmm. back in 1926 or seven, I believe. Uh, in 1962, Arnold Palmer had won his third Masters. He won in 58, 60, 62. He was the king in every which way. And Jack Nicklaus came along and won the U.S. Open as a rookie, and all of a sudden it was like this upstart. Well, they were playing an exhibition on the course I grew up in, and Nicklaus had to withdraw at the last minute due to illness, and Doug Sanders, who wasn't in the Hall of Fame, but won over 20 times on the PGA Tour, never won a major, they were playing an exhibition on the course I grew up in. In those days, there were no ropes. We could walk literally hand in hand. I was pulling on his trousers and talking to Mr. Palmer the entire day. And um, I just was fascinated with the raw power that he showed, the strength. Uh, he didn't swing like anybody else. He swung like himself. Uh, he was personable. He looked you in the eye. He made me as a 10 or 11-year-old feel very special. And about halfway through the round, I said, Mr. Palmer, can I have a golf ball, please? And he was the king of golf, and he was the hottest player in the world. And he had Arnold Palmer golf balls made by Wilson with his name on it that he used. And I just thought that was exciting. He said, sure, kid, I'll give you a ball and we're done. At the end of the round, he must have been swamped by, there were probably three or 4,000 people watching. He must have been swamped by half of them, all wanting something. He gave away his glove, tees, balls, went to his bag. And he finally looked at the a gallery there and said, I'm, I'm out of stuff, guys. I'm sorry. Well, this is like the, if you ever saw the Super Bowl, Super Bowl commercial and me, Joe, me, Joe Green, throws his jersey to this kid. Yep. I turned when he said, I'm out of things, and I was a little kid, and I started walking home. Our house was on a public golf course on a dirt road, and you could see the 18th green from our home. I started walking home. I got about 100 feet away, and he and Mr. Palmer yells over to me, hey, kid, are you forgetting something? And I looked at him with tears, but you're out of everything. He said, no, I'm not. I told you I'd give you a golf ball. He pulled it out of his pocket and threw it to me. And oh, that's cool. Then, you know, you, you, you fast forward. 15, 17 years later, and I'm playing with Arnold in a practice round with the PGA Tour event. And I've told him that story numerous times. There's a bunch of great Palmer stories. So what it meant to me was I wanted to emulate the way he treated people, the way he made you feel special, and I liked it. It seemed like he played the game with emotion. 
So many players now today are taught to play like robots. Mm -hmm. Is that wrong? I don't know, but it doesn't look like to me they're having fun. You know, and I always thought it is a game. And we want to remember it's a game. That, that's the biggest thing. So kids, I'm telling you, right now, yep. wherever you are in your development, and I think it's great to try to be a great golfer. It's a wonderful goal. There's so many things you learn about life and yourself as you develop your golf game. Please don't ever forget it's a game. It was invented to be, and that will drive you crazy, but it's still invented to be a challenge to be fun. And Mark's son, um, Tyler, who we talked about, he's now on the web.com tour. Uh, he's been a good buddy of mine since uh, even before high school days. Uh, we got the opportunity to play high school together, and then we went our separate ways um, to college. But Tyler, and, and why the reason I bring him up is because he, with, with your assistance and your teaching, um, he is probably one of the best I've ever seen at separating golf and the athletic side of things from the academic, the social, and his hobbies. Um, and, and it's almost like a light switch. Um, you know, once he gets to the golf course, he's totally immersed in that. Uh, I mean, you can even break it down further than that, even in between shots, he's eating, he's doing other things, he's involving himself, um, so he's not 100% involved or committed um, when, he's not, when he doesn't have to be. Uh, and Tyler's always been one of the best at that, and I love that you send him an example. Well, I, I, you know, hopefully some of that, you know, you try to instill in your kids, and I know your parents are doing the same thing, you know, good fundamentals in life. You know, good, good golf is really almost like being successful and happy in your own life, having priorities in order. Make sure you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. But I tried to set the example to him that when I played and when he played, you're trying to do your very best. I think you owe it to yourself to always give it 110%. But as soon as you walk off that golf course, your score is not a measure of the person that you are. If you ever feel that way about golf, it's going to be too hard to play. I would catch myself on tour at times if I shot 74, I felt bad. And there's nothing wrong with being disappointed in a, a score that's not up to your standard. And if I shot 66 feeling on top of the world, and I realized I didn't want that to dictate the rest of my day or my week or my self-worth. So I think that trying to learn that, that keep golf in its place. And, and Tyler has done a good job with that. And one of the ways it helps you do that, when I worked with juniors and would try to help the kids when they were Mike, Mike and Tyler were kids in the high school golf team, I would talk about you need to have other passions in life. I mean, it can be music, it can be other sports, it can be family activities, it can be on a spiritual level. You need to have something else that means more to you than even golf does, so that when you do play golf, you can keep it in perspective. I hope that makes sense to you, yeah. because That's, if you do that, then, then golf doesn't become the end all, that your life is over when you hit a bad shot. It's too hard to play the game, but you're always going to hit bad shots. That's so interesting to me because, um, you know, we have a 10-time PJ Tour winner here and one of the most awesome, influential guys in my life, and he's telling me, to play better golf, you can't be as involved as you are in the game. Uh, well, I, much. I'm going to tell you. I'm on gonna, a 24-7 basis. When you when you were young, that worked against you for a while. Yeah, it did. I got to hit every shot. I'll admit it. And, you know, Walter Hagen, I believe, said I expect to miss five or seven shots a day. So if I miss one, it's okay. I miss one. What I did set goals for myself, and I would try to teach my son, that you don't want to miss shots ahead of time by not being prepared. Mm -hmm. I had the chance to meet a man in 1990. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. 1992, I met Bert Yancey. For some of you who are older and the follow golf post, you may remember that name. was a eight-time winner. was a brilliant man um, who helped me develop a pre-shot routine. And what that pre-shot routine did, it took, me, it took me out of the results and got me so into the setup, mental preparation of each shot, that the shot would be a byproduct of that. The shot would just happen. Mm -hmm. Good golfers don't think of where the club is when they're swinging. It's on automatic pilot. Uh, it's, medically, it's a medical fact. You can't perform an overlearned skill on the conscious level. You can't do it. When you're, when you're a kid and you're in the third or fourth grade learning longhand, and you're writing letters, and you're writing your name, or you're learning to write in the first grade letters, you literally have to make a deliberate effort to put a line down, match it up. Well, let's move forward to the eighth grade, and you're just writing longhand, and you're writing notes and letters, and you're preparing papers. 
you don't think about what you're doing. If you do, you'd be surprised. I've got a challenge for you kids and parents. Write your name like you're signing an autograph or signing a check. And then very slowly, right underneath that name, do it in very slow motion, try to write the same name and make it look the exact same. The density of the ink, the little skips, everything. You will feel like you've never written your name before. You won't be able to do it. You're, you're <laughs> taking an over skill and then putting on a, it on a conscious level. So when you practice, that's that third grader learning to write his name. You can think about a position if you want. You can work on balance and set up. But when you go to play, you've got to let it happen. And then you've got to be mature enough to realize if the results aren't what I want, you go back to the basics and work on those. But um, that's an incredible part of golf. So if you can not live and die with every shot, if you can just let it happen. I've got a good friend here in Jacksonville who's actually the head coach for Jackson University who won their first tournament a few weeks ago that started yeah, the year. Great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Mike Blackburn played the DGA Tour. Uh, if your kid's smart, it's a great school. Uh, he's looking for great players, and it's they're building a program. But he was a very good teacher. He's very respected. And he said to me one time, and I loved it, he said, you've got to prepare for a shot like it's the most important thing you're going to do. And when you hit it, you've got to hit it like you don't care where it goes. Mm -hmm. And that may sound like a dichotomy or a contradiction, but it's not. That's the way you need to play. That's so interesting. And, and I remember, you know, looking back on the high school days, I remember coming in after, you know, a, a 40 or, or, or some bad round that I'd play uh, or some difficult, you know, loss that we went through. We ended up being a great team, you didn't a have great program. <laughs> we didn't, uh, not, not my senior year. Um, but I, I specifically remember you asking me, um, you know, I'd come to you and say, I bogey this, I bogey that. These were all my mistakes. Uh, a, B, Z, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And you would ask me every time, you know, Mike, look at the positives of your own. Give me three positives about your day today and go home with that in mind. Well, but I think that you as parents, if, if your parents play golf, you understand it. If you're just making golf available for your kids, I hope you understand it, are, are learning this, that it's such a great mirror for life. I mean, we can Absolutely. dwell on the negatives in life. We can dwell on, on the things, the glass half full, the glass half empty. But to be a successful golfer, for you golfers out there, uh, the young ones, you better look at the positives because there's going to be a lot of shots that don't go where you want, bad bounces, human bad swings. We are imperfect creatures. We don't make perfect swings. But if you can mentally prepare to hit the shot, give it the best effort you've got, that's what you've got to be satisfied with. But it's all like life. You know, you can, you can finish a day as a dad coming home and complain in front of the family at dinner about how – what went wrong with the office, yep. instead of maybe saying, hey, I'm back home, I'm glad to see you all, i got a job. It's all how you look at things, and the best golfers look at things in the positive, I promise you. And in the present, I'd say. That's very it's, true, too. Staying in the moment and uh, you know, being present. Same thing if you were to go home to your kids. You know, be in that moment, enjoy the time that you have with them. And junior golfers, the same thing, going home to your parents after a bad round and, or spending time with your family. Keep that in mind. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Tyler and uh, his development because um, it's, it's been astonishing to me. Um, he's not that he was ever behind the eight ball or, or not a good player, but you know, he rose up through the ranks and he was one that continuously improved and kept getting better and better and better. And he continues to do that. And I think that's why he's had some success. Um, you know, talk a little bit about where he started and maybe the the process behind you know what or what you guys do. I, I'd love to get a you know inside look and, and give these guys a look at, at that process. Well, to be honest with you, having a dad who was a professional golfer, I don't know if that was good or bad for him to watch play <laughs> golf. But I never tried to uh, bring uh, my work home. It was always always around us. I mean, when your young kids are traveling to PGA Tour with you, um, they see it. But I didn't care if he played golf. I really don't. Yeah. If he told me tomorrow he wanted to be a musician, which he might do. You never he know. might. For all you out there, Tyler loves the guitar. Too. Yeah, but <laughs> that would be fine. I just want my children. And he has, we have two, well, he has two older sisters. I want them to be happy and productive and just good people, which they are. Mm -hmm. But um, I never pushed golf at all. It was available to him when he was little. And I went to the practice range here at the PPC. We live here in Ponte Vedra. Uh, he would go with me because I want to spend time with Dad. 
he would go over the corner with a little club whacking balls around, but never took it serious. He didn't play a junior golf like at a really young age and take it serious. As a matter of fact, he really loved baseball, and I loved watching him play baseball. So he played baseball for four or five years and was a pretty good little ball player. And then at age 12, he decided that he wanted to play golf. He said, Dad, I don't get the ball enough in baseball. So I said, well, that's okay. But to tell you how little that I worried about him playing golf, one summer after travel baseball, he's about 10, I noticed that he was over beside me. I was practicing to go back out on tour, and he's got his club at the top of the swing with no backswing. And he's hitting balls that way. Picture a baseball player to play. Yep. There was no backswing. The club was up here, and he was hitting balls. That's and, and, and funny he, you say that because he still works on that drill today, doesn't he? Well, but this wasn't a drill. No, right, this right. Is something he just figured out. And I remember <laughs> thinking, wow, could that be the new way to play golf? Because <laughs> all of us struggle with the backswing, the transition, waiting on it, pausing at the top. We all tend to get a little anxious and quick. Yeah. And I said, if you can hit a ball from there, and I never said a word all summer long, he hit the ball without a backswing. And I thought that was the neatest thing ever. But once he decided he wanted to play golf, he came to me. I think he was a 12 and a half, 13, said, I really want to play. And the first question surprised me, how long will it take me to be really good? I said, well, that's up to you. I said, I think you've got a lot of God-given talent, but it's going to be how much work you want to put in it. And uh, ever since then, he's worked hard. He's continued to progress. And I think for parents, we want our kids to be good at what they do. We want them to be happy. We want them to be successful. The biggest thing I think we all fight is not pushing them. And I think that, I really think that it's better to be good and continue to improve. I've seen great juniors go to college with all this pressure and expectation and not play nearly as well as they did when they were juniors. It's not unusual to see that at all. You can, without naming any of them, you can go look at a lot of U.S. junior champions and look where they are now, and a lot of them aren't even in golf. Right. And the truth is, mom and dad and kids, very few people end up playing professional golf. Not that everybody wants to. But, boy, if you learn this game at your age, all of you must be pretty good. You're playing, you're playing junior tournaments. You're looking to play maybe golf in college. Um, you're obviously very good at it. This game, you will stand out compared to the average golfer right now. When you're in a company or working somewhere, when you go out and shoot 78, you, you're going to have people's mouths drop. Now, that may not be what your goal is, but a lot of you, that's what the reality is going to be, and that's not a bad reality. But I really think with Tyler, we kept it. I never pushed him. I never once talked to him about the position of the club, where the backswing was. I let him just play. Because I watched too many Hall of Famers, Trevino and Hubert Green and Lanny Watkins and Raymond Floyd, yep. and all these players, every one of them looked different. Not one of them had the classic golf swing. And um, because I think real champions, if you really want to be a champion in golf, it comes from in here and your work ethic and your values, not from a perfect golf swing. So I let him just develop the way he wanted to develop. And the only thing I ever worked very, very disciplined with him was the setup. Because the one thing in common, you'll never see a Hall of Famer aim 20 yards too far to the right or 30 yards too far to the left. You'll never find a Hall of Famer who didn't have um, – if the hitting area they weren't in the right position, we both know, and uh, I've played with, and we see him all the time here, is Jim Furyk. Jim Furyk's a Hall of Famer. And his father was a club professional up in Pennsylvania, and he had the wisdom not to change his son's swing when other club pros gave him a hard time about it. And college and, coaches, for that matter. And they wanted to change him, but he resisted. Yep. And look at the kind of player he is now. You, we talked about that overlearned skill, your signature, under pressure you're going to re revert back to what's normal to you. So for Raymond Floyd, that little backswing or, or Lee Trevino's action or Arnold Palmer's follow-through, if he were to worry about what that looked like under pressure, he wouldn't be able to play. So I think the biggest thing is the fundamentals, pre-shot routine, setup, rhythm of the golf swing. I think a good grip's important, but as soon as I tell you you have to have a good grip, you can look at one of my contemporaries, Paul Azinger, who's a marginal Hall of Famer himself, won the PGA, had a great career. His grip was as strong as anybody you'd ever want to know. And then Jose Maria Olofabo, a friend from Spain, had a weak grip, and he is in the Hall of Fame. Um, but I would teach a kid a good grip, preferably. 
setup that's all makes sense, proper setup, and then let them develop their personal swing. I really mean that. Such a wonderful game we play, isn't it? It's a game of a lifetime. I still learn things now. I mean, I learn, I literally learn things every time I want to go off. Yes. Yeah. It, it may not be new, but wow, that's how that works. I love seeing the artistry of it because you know, in a game of what some call to be a bomber's game nowadays, um, you still have Bubba. Yes, he's a bomber, but he's homemade. He's an artist out there. He's shaping shots. He should listen. To right. He should. He should run away from teachers. Yeah, right to left. He he doesn't keep his feet on the ground. He's not stable whatsoever. Um, there's countless examples. Jim Furyk, we already named the biggest, maybe of which being Jordan Speed, who many think is conventional, but he's far from it. Um, he's got a wacky grip. He's you know in a in a cup or or, or extended position with his left wrist, the top of the backswing. Um, and Dustin Johnson, you, you know, you don't find, uh, yes, there's the pretty golf swing like Adam Scott and Jason Day and, and those guys, and they're great players, don't get me wrong, but this game's all about artistry and developing your own personal style. Yeah, I think that the great players, uh, for you young ones, I one time asked Jack Nicklaus, I was very fortunate, it took me six tries to get to the tour school. So I know that perseverance is an incredibly important quality. But that's true in life. Uh, you moms and dads who have jobs, uh, uh, you realize that to be successful at what you do and to take care of your families, it, it doesn't come easy. But I've always was taught that most things that are worthwhile don't come easy. But you've yeah. got to be you've got to be persistent. But I mean you've you've got to really develop for you what works for you, something that you believe in. And if you do that, uh, I think the uh, the personal style, uh, your personality needs to come out. I asked Jack Nicholas, uh, I won right away on tour. I got very lucky. I qualified on a Monday at Durrell, the old Monday qualifying days, and walked off Sunday as the champion at Durrell, and which was a dream come true. Oh. Because, I mean, those tournaments had the Palmers and the Nicholases and the Watsons and the Trevinos all playing in it. And, um, and then I, I stayed exempt, but I struggled a bit. And I went to Nicholas one time who was so kind to me and uh, I asked Mr. Nicholas, I asked Jack Nicholas, I said, you know, uh, I'm pretty outgoing. I'm a type A personality. I've got a lot of energy. And I've been trying to be really, you know, focused on the course and be a little more uh, disciplined that way. So, Mark, mm -hmm. I really have found that you need to be who you are. You know, Trevino doesn't need to be quiet. Ben Hogan certainly didn't need to That talk. wouldn't work. <laughs> wouldn't work. He'd explode. Uh, and he's one of the greatest I've ever, ever had the pleasure to play with. Yeah. But – Kids, you need to be who you are. Let your own personality come out of the golf course. That doesn't mean you don't need discipline. We want to we want to show self control, respect for the rules, and and, and and the courtesy on the golf course. But if you're a talkative kid, then be that way on the golf course. If you're more of a quiet person and you're playing, then that's the way you should play. But don't try to be something you're not based on some image you think will make you play better. I really think you need to let your personality shine in the way you conduct yourself and in the way you swing the golf club. That's great advice. Um, that, that's super invaluable advice to anyone out there looking, um, you know, confused with the swing change or looking for a coach or just lost in the, in the game, which, you know, so many of us are, um, and it happens to everyone. Um, so when in doubt and, and when searching for those answers, just remember that advice um, from Mark here. All right, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, I want to talk college golf for just a second, and then we'll get back into uh, a couple tour memories and, uh, you know, hear some stories here. Um, during Ty's search for, for college and, um, you know, the whole recruiting process, how did how, – how smoothly did, did that go down? And, um, you know, what were the influencing factors – to sending him to be a Gator at the University of Florida. Well, I didn't send him to be a Gator. You know, I've always been a fan of the University of Florida. I followed their sports programs. The coach was a lifetime friend of mine. But that wasn't – I really had no influence on Tyler going there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the fact that he liked the Gators – usually as kids you pick up on professional teams you like. Normally it's in the town you live. The University of Florida is very close to us. It's only an hour away. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't play college golf, so I didn't come from a point of, let me tell you what I did, son. Uh, Tyler was kind of on his own with that. As a parent, uh, a doting father, I would have loved him to stay right at home. You know, I'd like my daughters to be home, and they've got their own families with six grandkids. But yep. life doesn't work that way. So Tyler, 
uh, and you're going to find this out. The better you play, the more people are interested in you. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of schools that talk to Tyler, a lot of Division I schools, a lot of great golf schools. He looked at several. I think one of the challenges I noticed as a father is there's so much pressure put on kids, especially if they've had some success in junior golf and they're winning tournaments and college coaches are more interested. It seems like they're more interested based on what you did last week. Yeah. So that's why you got to be careful. That's interesting, too, because the way Tyler developed, um, I'm, I'm certain that all of that, you know, pressure and focus from college coaches came right there on the on the borderline, which back then was right around junior year, end of junior year. Well, that's the thing that frustrates me for you parents. Now it's even earlier. I don't know the answer to that. I can't believe they're recruiting now kids in ninth and fifth grade. The college coaches that I talk to, and, and this is the way it is, these coaches want kids to commit as early as they can. And I remember thinking, well, that's a, that's a challenge. But the coach may kick, pick a kid who's 15 or 16 off from a scholarship, and that kid may not be the same player when he graduates. Oh, no doubt. Because there's so many interests in life that change and so, and so many variables in life. Is the kid still really committed to golf when he's 17 or 18 when he finds out about other interests in life? Yeah. But um, Tyler was, uh, you know, I guess you could say highly recruited by most of the big schools. And uh, as a parent, I wanted him to stay close to home. I tried not to overimpose that. He knew my feelings. Uh, I would have loved him to play right here. We've got a couple of great schools here in Jacksonville. Yes, but he ended up uh, going to Florida. And I was happy because he was close to home. I don't know about you parents. Maybe you're different. But I still wanted to have an influence on my children. But I think the reality was more for me than my son that – once they get to 18 or 19, he was uh, 18 when he graduated. He turned 18 in the spring of the senior year. That They're young adults, and they have the right to make those decisions. He weighed, I think, the advice of his parents, but he did end up staying close to home. It all worked out fine, but he got a, he got a fine education, so he's prepared to take care of himself, to take care of his family, uh, whether it's in golf, which it appears it is for now, or whether it's in some other avenue. I think the other thing, as a parent, as you go through the process, uh, there's all this talk about paying for Division One schools. He happened to win. Yeah, he happened to play this. He happened to play it with a school that's probably got as rich tradition in golf as any school in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, with numerous national championships and and you know dozens and dozens of players who come from that school who are professionals, successful on the PGA Tour. And a lot of, to do so. yeah, a lot of kids look to that. Yeah, I think the big thing I would tell a kid. Don't let your ego get in the way. If someone said, I can get a scholarship and I'm going to be scouted by a Florida or a Georgia uh, or an Alabama or a Stanford or whoever, it might, a Texas, I'm not trying to leave anybody, Oklahoma State, but I may not play, I, I think that I would say go where you'll be challenged and have players that are better than you, but go where you're going to play. You will not get any better if you don't play. So don't get so caught up if you're a pretty good player that I've got to go to a highly ranked school unless you really can't handle that pressure. Um, so true. Because I think you need to go somewhere where you're going to play a lot because you won't get better without playing. And go somewhere where you'll get an education that has meaning, where you can get an education or a degree that will serve you, again, to care for your family, to develop skills in something that you'll spend a lot of your life, a lot of your time, making your living. So I think those two factors have to be considered. Yeah, I love that. And I'd also like to add, I tell my clients and anyone um, you know, that comes to me for recruiting advice, if you pick a school that if you're not an athlete or you're not playing golf, that you would be comfortable at either way. I like that too, you know, not just based on the golf. And not based off a coach or a, a player on the team because coaches lead. Well, just a one real life Players experience. Friends. For your for you parents, one of the schools that one in Tyler and Tyler had kind of unofficially said, "I think I'm going to come there," and I talked to the coach, who I, is a good guy, and I said, "Now you plan to be here, right?" Absolutely, I plan to be here. He was gone the next year. Plans change, and there's nothing. He's got to take care of his family, so don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, don't go just because he got a great golf program, just because the coach is renowned. Uh, I, I think the first reason to go, it's what's a good fit for you. So what's a good fit for your family, uh, economically, logistically, education-wise, environment-wise, and then let the golf fit in with that. Right. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Well said. Well, you go through it as a parent, you know, and you just hope your kids come out okay. It's not all right. It's doing just fine. <laughs> all right, we're going to shift gears. Uh, we'll talk a little tour life. What was your, this might be a tough question or an easy one, but what was your best memory from the PGA Tour? Well, if you ask me my best memory in golf, I would, have, I would have had to say uh, winning the junior, Jacksonville Junior Championship at 14. That I remember wow. vividly. But most exciting tour experience, I would say, was the first win, like so many things in life, your first, winning at Doral. I said I qualified on a Monday, which means in those days there were 150 guys, there were 15, 20 spots. I shot low enough to get one of those spots, and Sunday night I'm on the 18th three and making an eight-footer to win. So that will never, ever be matched as far as excitement. But then you've got to throw in winning a player's championship, winning a tour championship. Yeah. Uh, I think when I got to 10 wins at the Tour Championship at the Olympic Club, that was a milestone for me. I remember thinking, God, it's kind of neat to win, and it takes two numbers to quantify it. Um, yeah, that was nice. Incredible. Playing Ryder Cup was the most intense of anything, <laughs> World Cups. But but all in all, the whole, the whole journey, I really pinched myself when I would think that I got paid to do something I would have paid to do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a quick story, one year at Augusta, it's a Sunday at the Masters, and I'm being paired with Seve Ballesteros uh, in a twosome on Sunday. We had an outside chance to win it. We had great final rounds. We have a little excess noise, I'm sorry. <laughs> and you can ask them if you would. Yeah. Yeah. Just one second, please. <laughs> Some visitors to the clubhouse. I don't blame them. It's a beautiful clubhouse. <laughs> but I was playing with Sebi Ballesteros on the fifth hole at Augusta. And I got off to a really slow start. And I was a couple over, which you can't do on a Sunday. If you do that, you're really going to have a problem. So I um, looked over on the fifth hole and saw that presence of the Hall of Famer walking down the fairway. I saw my parents and my kids and my wife. The dog was in the azaleas, and I pinched myself. I said, what would I, as a young man, have paid to get to come do this? And they're going to pay me today something. It may not have been the green jacket. But um, I think that excitement uh, of getting to do all those things and, and, and play a game that I would play for free and to make a living, it, I never felt like I worked. So I, I've been very grateful for that. I'll share my best experience just real quick because it just popped in my head. But – the opportunity to walk for the first time Augusta National um, during the first round, it was on Thursday, uh, two years back, 2013, with Mark, uh, not realizing that he had played 14 yeah. Masters, and um, just seeing the the atmosphere of Augusta, um, how, how many people were there, how beautiful it was, and then having the expertise and the experiences and the stories from Mark um, and having that along, along the ride was, I mean, something Well, about. it was interesting to be on the outside of the ropes. I had not done that at Augusta. And uh, I can see why the galleries there love it. It's a breathtaking place. The, uh, the atmosphere there and all those the regular people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's fun either, either way. More fun inside the ropes, yeah, but no it's doubt. fun either way. Yeah. And we were watching uh, T.J. Vogel that day. Yeah, they were watching a uh, one of the Publix and fellow Florida Gator. Yeah, a teammate of my son's. Yep, that was awesome. That was great. Um, switch back to maybe not so great memories, um, but in the long run, they always came out to be positive. How did you deal with going through Q school, tour school, tour school six times, and dealing with that adversity, those setbacks? And those opposite. Well, I think if you ever get to any level of golf of proficiency, you've had to learn to deal with adversity, yeah. which is why golf is such a wonderful game of a lifetime in that you won't succeed if you can't handle the uh, ups and downs. I think you learn more from the adversity than you do from the good times because um, you find out where you're deficient and where you can improve. When you're playing good, you don't make any adjustments. You don't make any changes. Um, but going to a tour school and missing was traumatic because you didn't have a job. Back then, the tour school was every six months. Mm -hmm. The first tour school I went to, they only gave 13 cards. So, you know, you've got 
500 guys at a tour school, three courses in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and they give 13 cards. That's pretty tough. They said yeah, the school, wow. they said the school's weak that year. And, and, and the, some of the guys that qualify were Calvin Pete, Tom Pertzer, Howard Twitty, all tour winners, and uh, Bruce Litsky, and on and on. So I don't think it was that week of a tour school. But I tell you how so I did. It sound like it. <laughs> I came home and I put my clubs up for a month or two, didn't touch them. Yep. My family, my brothers and I had started a landscaping business in the late 60s, and I would go back to drafting landscape plans and working in the design company. And believe it or not, before we even got on tour, we had started some golf course construction work, which grew into an international golf course design firm. So the first course I designed was in the late 70s before I went around as I was getting my tour card. So I would come home, and like I said, I had other interests. I had to feed a family. I had a, a beautiful wife and a little girl. And so I went back to work, and then the clubs would come back out, and uh, I would just get back at it. I had a love for the game. That's what got me through the university, though. It wasn't just the compet competitive nature that I do have. Yeah. It was I really loved to challenge myself. And when you don't succeed at something, you got to figure, how do I make it work? No different than you dads and moms to go to work and then how do I make my business work? So I had to find out how to get better. That's so interesting. And I think with the struggle of going through six tour schools and having success so early and so quick on the one day qualifier, um, you know, you didn't have success early, but once you got out, you know, you won it off the Monday qualifier. That's so interesting to think because, you know, if Jordan Spieth hadn't hold that bunker shot at the John Deere, could have gone on the water. where would Jordan be today? And well, he'd still be fine, trust me. <laughs> he'd be just fine. He's a great player. But um, it's funny to think that those present moment things compel you and, and propel, you, propel you into into another open door, another opportunity. Yeah, they also prepare you to go through those other yeah. doors because it makes you better. You know, um, there's a saying, what – you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I don't know if I agree with that all the time, but I do think adversity refines us. So when you're challenged, uh, when you're challenged in life, you figure out a way to get through the challenge. Mm -hmm. It makes you a little tougher. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it makes us a little wiser. And I think missing those six tour schools, when I got into the heat of battle, and my, it was actually my second opportunity. It was only my 14th terminal tour. But uh, at the end of that first Six months on tour, I was in the last group of Pensacola. I shot 64 on Saturday at the Pensacola Open and finished fourth. So I had a taste of it. I, I, I made some adjustments. I got a little caught up in trying to win there. So when I got to Doral, I was so focused all week on staying in the present. If I go back and read the clippings, this is before sports psychologists. Yeah. I had missed the cut the week before at the Honda Classic. And in the old days, when you made the cut, you were in the next week. So it was a big deal for uh, – what we call tour rabbits, if you weren't exempt, right? So you had to go from missing a cut to getting to the next week, practicing, playing on a Monday, and hope to get in. So I was so disappointed that I missed the cut by looking at the leaderboard and figuring, even par is going to make the cut, and I'm two under, I'm okay. Well, then I bogey 16, I'm one under. And then I bogey 17, and I'm even. And then I bogey the last hole, worrying about it, wishing it, not staying in the moment. And I went down to Doral with the attitude, and I used the term, I'm going to isolate each golf shot one at a time. If it's for an eight or a two, I'm going to give it the same energy. And I pulled it off all week long, and wow. Little did I know that I get to the last hole and have an eight-footer. And I remember saying to, myself, saying to myself, okay, what is your mantra this week? It's just an eight-footer. Focus on it. And right. I'm very fortunate that it went in. But I, it was a light going off to me that that's how you do it. You stay yep. in the moment. You stay in the present, you don't get caught up in consequences, and you do things the right way and it'll work out. Interesting. It's, a, it's always back to the thing, you know, focus on what's right in front of you. That's exactly it. And that eight-footer is a great example. It's just an eight-footer. I mean, how many have you made in practice? Well, now? not just that. It's no, if you think about it, you know, it's no more important than the eight-footer you made on the first hole the first day when no galleries are watching, no TVs yep. are on. It's the same value. Yep. And why everyone amps the 18th hole, the first cheap jitters, you know, um, everyone forces, um, you know, pressure situations and stuff like that. It's it's funny to think when when every shot's isolated and separate from each other, it doesn't uh, have any more importance than the other. Right, it almost looks silly to do something. Yeah, like it is. 
But, you know, we're human and we get caught up in the moment. I do think the press nowadays, I don't envy young players who want to be great golfers. Uh, the, the, the press and the involvement, and every, your every move is, 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 is covered. There's not as much privacy, even in your personal life. And that's something of, you know, those few, the handful that are good enough to play professional golf, that's something they consider when they make that decision. Some people don't like it. I know players on tour who are very good players who make good livings who don't win a lot, and I think that some of it's because of whether it's conscious or subconscious. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that exposed. Right. I love what I do, but I don't – everybody's dream is to be number one because of what goes with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. that's just a personal decision. Yeah, that's interesting too. Well, um, folks, it looks like we're running out of time here. Um, I wanted to thank Mark for coming on. Uh, that was so awesome, and, and hope everybody – took one tidbit of insight from Mark, um, you know, his invaluable life lessons and just little secrets from the tour, you know, helped me so much as a player. And, and uh, I'm going to open it up for questions here, but that will conclude our September webinar uh, for Four College Golf. Uh, if you guys have any questions for Mark or I um, about junior golf, college golf, uh, pro golf, anything in between, uh, feel free to go ahead and open up now and let us know.